I think it is time for another episode of True Fairy Sightings, keeping the wonder and fairy faith alive and bringing a little beautiful magic to the day. Last time I looked at fairy sightings and talked about one of my own, this time I will be adding one of my husband's many strange sightings. I hope you enjoy these peculiar tales. It was recorded some time ago that an old parish clerk who was the brother of the sexton at a particular village in England, she almost 80, and he had passed away at 82 years old. When she was younger, her father had been a maker of leatherwork breeches, and her mother with a new baby. She could not remember if the baby was her or her sister, but the mother was sleeping in bed with the new baby by her side. During the night she woke as the light was fading and found the baby had completely vanished. Naturally she cried out in fear and her fear was that the fairies had taken the newborn. She leapt from the bed to search for the child. At the foot of the bed she found the baby being undressed by many small sandy fairy things. They fled through a hole in the floorboards laughing and shrieking all the while. She grabbed the child from the floor to herself and found as she did that these little creatures had placed all the pins head to head as they had unpinned them from the baby's clothes. From that day forward and for many months after that baby slept wedged between husband and wife and she would even pin the baby's clothes to the bed sheets and pillows to make it more difficult for the fairy creatures to kidnap the child. This incident was recorded to have taken place at an old house on the south side of a vicarage gate that was demolished and a new one built in its place. The same teller of the story also told that she had heard of a local woman who had had her baby taken and a changeling left in its place, a poor weak and sickly thing. However, she had decided to treat the little thing kindly, and because of this, on rising each morning, she found a little money had been left in her pocket for her. The witness firmly believed in fairies. In Preston in 1922, there was a delightful sighting that was witnessed. The record is of a beautiful female nature spirit that was living in a thick hedge full of brambles and hawthorn that was full of red berries. She was recorded as being roughly three to four foot tall, wearing a delicate transparent film-like garment. She would look at the witness with a friendly face, kind and engaging, gentle, and yet the witness also had a feeling coming from this nature fairy that she had a great energy and power that she was able to keep under control. Her aura could be seen, and this was recorded as a cloud of soft radiant colour with shafts of dazzling light flashing and radiating from her. The colours of the aura were described as being almost beyond explanation, but ranged through pale rose, soft green, lavender and pale blue. She also radiated a sense of happiness. The witness would meditate on the vision of this fairy and feel a connection to her joyfulness and delight. However, they also recorded that the temptation to stay in that state of bliss was very real and it always took effort to return fully to human bodily awareness. Another recorded incident was set in the Lake District where a witness saw a group of fairies dancing or playing across a stream on a patch of higher ground. They seemed to be female, dressed in blue, with palest blue wings that were oval in shape and fluttered as they danced in the round. The witness also recorded that some of these figures had a sort of belt with what looked like a horn instrument hanging from them and that they were very small 
only around six inches in height. The flesh was very pale pink. The fairies looked like they were engaging in some sort of country or folk style dancing and the witness had the sensation that somehow they were creating tiny flowers that seemed to appear and disappear and an energy that seemed to radiate from them that gave off silvery sparks that looked almost like electric. The whole group was described as being surrounded by a haze or mist that was beautiful, rising to roughly eight inches above the figures and to a point over the middle of the group. There was a feeling that it was there to protect these creatures, creating a protective bubble. Over time watching them it was noticed that the dance was ritual-like, moving place slightly, and the aura moving with them, and within the centre of the ring was forming a glowing pulsing rose pink coloured globe. The aura that protected the fairies was becoming almost like a large inverted glass bowl. As the witness watched, little by little the whole scene just drifted away. At a place called Lagnikieli, in the Isle of Man, a witness was fishing from a coastal ledge of rocks. They noticed a dense grey mist or fog approaching and decided to pack up and head home while the little footpath was still easily followed. As they were packing up their fishing gear, there was a sound of what seemed like a crowd of children chattering and laughing. The witness locked up confused at the sound and saw a whole fleet of little boats on either side of the rock where he had been sat. The boats had small star-like lights and one of the creatures, the fairy folk, shouted out in the Manx language, poor times and dirty weather and herring enough at the people of this world, nothing at us. Then they dropped off and went to gator the flitters, as the witness said. A woman who was the widow of a clergyman was resting in Regent's Park in London. She had a horrendous foot injury that was bothering her with pain and she was building up the energy to get up and make her way home. As she was sitting there, she noticed a little man dressed all in green and looking at her with a very kind face. He spoke to her saying, go home, we promise that you shan't pain you tonight. And at that he disappeared, and with it the intense pain as well. She walked home easily and slept soundly and pain free. Another time she recorded she had seen a glimpse of a group of fairy folk dressed flower-like, dancing on a flower bed but it had only been fleeting and there had been no sound. A Miss Katie Richardson recorded an event from May 1942 which she described as so lovely and unexpected that it stayed with her all her life. It happened at the village of West Meon in Hampshire at a place called Lippin Wood. She was aged 43 at the time. She stated that she was walking in this renowned peaceful place and reached a shallow saucer-like depression in the ground. To one side of this stood a tree. She noticed a very disgruntled group of small looking men collecting twigs and leaves and cleaning the area. They were using little brushes and placing the rubbish in a pile at one place within the hollow. It was then that the witness saw the most incredible thing, as if that wasn't astonishing enough, to the point that she caught her breath so that she did not spoil what she was seeing. From near the tree, a group of fairies came dancing happily. They were around 18 to 20 inches tall, dressed in shades of pink. One of these fairies made a motion to the little men who were standing still and these brought a table and small chairs to where the fairy figure motioned. The fairies had a cloth and this was placed over the table. Next, a beautiful looking two-tier cake that astonished the witness as she herself was a professional cook and had no idea how to replicate such a thing. When they seemed content, they disappeared again 
and a tall or queen-like fairy figure appeared surrounded by more fairies. The main fairy's dress was of a deeper pink, with a full crinoline skirt covering her feet. On her head was a crown, and she carried something that the witness presumed to be a wand. At the table they all curtsied and sat. The Queen Fairy seemed delighted by the cake. This was cut to reveal a deep pink inner. The witness began to wonder if the male fairy folk would receive a piece of the cake when she heard a faint sound, and at this the fairies, all of them, hurried away. The males even whisked away the chairs, the table and everything. Nothing remained. The witness had seen fairies again at this place, but never the Queen Fairy, and she stated she had doubted the existence of the creatures before this strange event, but after that had no doubt at all of their existence. And now for one of our own sightings from around eight years ago when we were living in Devon. It will come as no surprise to people who know my husband Mark's artwork that he feels a close connection to the fairy folk, their unnatural history in their world and folklore. And for this sighting I must stay categorically first, there were no substances involved, not even a cup of coffee. On the contrary, this was broad daylight and we were walking our dogs, although to be honest Mark does see things often and I have grown used to this over the years. Nearby where we lived is a patch of moorland called Haverley Moor, nearby the lovely village of Hatherley. This is a piece of wild land, common land. It has a monument, a couple of holy wells or springs and a very strange empty woodland. And from here you can see all across to Dartmoor, a really beautiful vista. So here we go one day to walk our two dogs, and it was a very cold day but lovely and bright, one of those crisp, clear, wintry days. We parked just off the crossroad where a picnic table sits for travellers to sit and rest while on their hikes or cycle rides and headed off to the left, to the smaller patch of moorland which looked less boggy after the rain. The dogs were mooching around on their leads, we were chatting as we walked down the little path. The old winter grasses were that lovely sandy brown colour, ochre and yellow in the daylight. To our left, where a dip in the land was evident, is a cluster of hazel trees. One of these is on its side, but still living, the life force still putting out branches and twigs. And we could tell this must be a marshier place of land because of the marsh grasses spiking through the dead bracken and the grass. We were just chatting about this and that and enjoying watching the dogs enjoying themselves and suddenly Mark stopped dead in his tracks and just stood staring at the cluster of hazel trees. He is an avid birder so I thought he must have seen some rarity. He does that a lot, the habitual birding habit. They're never not watching for something interesting. But no. I asked what was in there and he said a little brown fella. So I asked, what is he doing? He said, he is sitting on the fallen tree trunk swinging his legs. He then said he was possibly about three foot tall, just sat there nonchalant, watching something. Mark tells me even to this day exactly the same description. He wasn't sure if the figure was clothed or if it was his skin, the fellow was like a little wild man though, not brown. He had the impression that the small chap had a beard. He was there long enough though for Mark to notice his solidity and reality. And I noticed Mark's watching something for quite some while too, as I had thought he was watching a bird. So I'm used to keeping myself and the dog still until he can identify the species. So it was probably more than a good minute or so. And then the little fellow just disappeared. Another day in the life of a fairy artist and folklorist then. I will add more to these true fairy sightings as they are so much fun, intriguing and delightful and inspiring all at once. 
I know they are not everyone's cup of tea, I understand that, but hey ho, a little lightness helps the day go by. I hope you've enjoyed this time's telling of tales. Until next time, dear friends, take care, brightest of blessings, and remember, don't play with the fairy folk, or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.